great. All right. So, um, hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Amanda Coven. I'm the Director of Education at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. I'm so excited that all of you are joining us today, especially on a day off. I want to tip my hats to you for taking the time to be here with us today. Um, and so before we begin, I want to let you know that we are recording this. It will be posted on our YouTube page. So if you know people who were unable to attend, um, this will be out there for them as a resource. Before we get started and I, and I hand it over to Sarah, I just want to um, give you a few updates on the museum and a couple of different things. So we, on January 4th, we relaunched our teach and learn portion of our website. So it includes the, the, the Multnomah County book list that has a whole um, suggestions of books for K-5 teachers. Um, that will address the concepts for Senate Bill 664. And I know that Sarah had looked at that and included some of those books in her talk today. And I will be going back to the library and submitting the books that she is recommending. So they are available there. If you do not live in Multnomah County, you can still use that as a resource to find books and hopefully you have them in your local library. But if you do live in Multnomah County or work in Multnomah County, you can, um, you can request to have those books for your class and, um, and not to rent them out, but um, check them out. <laughs> Otherwise, we also launched a virtual tour of the Oregon Holocaust Memorial. So that's really, really exciting. It is a free resource. It comes with a teacher's guide that you just have to request online. Um, so that's all free. So we highly recommend that you checking that out with your students. Um, on January 15th at 10.30 a.m., so that is on President's Day, um, I'm going to be hosting a professional development called Curiosity and Questions, um, Curiosity and Questions, Critical um, Conversations Around the, the Holocaust. So if you have questions about the Holocaust, how to teach it, or you've heard of something, or you have a question that you don't know how to address with students, I'll be holding a session on January 15th, and I'll be sending more information out about that. Two other professional developments I wanna highlight that are for K-12 educators. On February 17th, we are partnering with, with Stockton University's Masters in Holocaust Studies program, so that's where I graduated from. And we are having Dr. Lauren Velasco and Dr. Mary Johnson come and meet with 20 educators to discuss human rights and justice in the classroom. So if you're interested in that, you can check it out online. We're capping that at 20 teachers. So it's a really um, nice, intimate group to do a deep dive into these topics with. And the last PD I wanna mention is we're hosting our first summer fellowship for teachers. And so again, it's for K-12 and the theme this year is, is, sorry, is reckoning with injustice. Um, so we're going to be taking a look at memory and memorial. Uh, the applications are open. They're due February 15th, and we're going to be selecting 10 teachers, again, K through 12, to meet with scholars from across the country to come to the museum for a conference in July, and then to produce some sort of educational resource for their classroom. Uh, Kelly, the virtual tour is recommended for all of our Holocaust resources are made for grade six and above, but there is no content really in that that's super traumatizing. So I would say fourth grade at the lowest, like fourth and fifth grade, I think could engage in it. Um, but obviously with any resource, we recommend that you check it out because you know your students best. Um, Finally, we have our art and writing competition. So if you teach sixth grade or above, um, we encourage you to share our art and writing competition with your students. I will share that information in the uh, post um, PD email. If you are requesting PDUs today, really, really important. If you want PDUs, you have to fill out the survey at the end. I will post a link in the chat. I will also send a link to the survey in the follow up email. If you're not requesting PDUs, we still encourage you to fill it out because we really like your feedback uh, to know how we did. Otherwise, 
I'm super, super excited to have with us Dr. Sarah Minslow today, the Assistant Professor of Children, or she is an Assistant <laughs> Professor of Children's and NYA Lit at Cal State University, Los Angeles. I met Sarah uh, two years ago at a conference on Holocaust denial um, in Charlotte, which is where she used to live and teach, and then she came out here to the West Coast. Some of you may recognize her. She was here in August of 2018, 19, 2019, I think. Um, and for uh, Oregon State University held a symposium and she did a session there. So I've gotten to know Sarah over the past couple of years and when I thought, how can we best support elementary school teachers to teach about the Holocaust? Sarah was the first person that came to my mind and I'm so elated that she's here today to share our knowledge with us. I don't wanna take up any more of her time. So Sarah, I'm gonna spotlight your video. And thank you for being here with us. Thank you for having me. Welcome everyone. I appreciate you taking time to come to such an important um, lesson and topic. Um, and I am excited that Oregon has been the, you know, the newest state to, to require Holocaust and genocide education. Um, so this is something I've been working on since 2010 when I finished my dissertation. Um, <clears throat> so I'm excited to be here. Thank you. I am going to share some slides. So there are a lot of slides in my presentation and I am not going to go through all of them. Um, but there are a lot of links um, and things there for you. And Amanda will share the slides with you so that you have those links. And they're also in the notes under some of the slides. There are also links to further resources for you as well. And my contact information, um, I encourage you to reach out to me if you do have specific questions or follow up, I'm happy. Um, I love working with teachers. I have a lot of respect for teachers because I lack the patience to do what you do on a daily basis. And I very much appreciate it. <laughs> um, so let me share my screen. And I also want to start with just a land acknowledgement. So Amanda mentioned I'm here in LA um, in sheltering at home, of course. <laughs> and uh, we are on the native lands of the indigenous Tongva people here. So I'm not sure where you all are in Portland, but um, we just recognize the land on which we are on. And also happy Martin Luther King Day. So talking about social injustice and equality and discrimination is um, fitting. <clears throat> for today. So this is my email address, just so you know, <clears throat> sminslow at calstatela.edu. Just a little bit of background about me. Um, I did teach at UNC Charlotte um, from 2011 until 2019, and I attended the 2012 Silberman Seminar for faculty across the United States and the world at the Holocaust Museum in D.C., which was like a two-week intensive training program, and we had to develop courses. <clears throat> um, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I actually developed four courses uh, at UNC Charlotte, War and Genocide in Children's Literature, Refugees in Literature and Film, Child Soldiers in Conflict, and the Introduction to Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights Studies. And so from teaching those courses for four or five years, I also led two teacher training workshops um, at the North Carolina Center for the Advancement of Teaching, and then also with the Charlotte Teachers Institute, I did a 10 month workshop with 13 educators in K through 12, and they each develop a different curriculum unit on using children's and young adult literature to teach issues around human rights that they chose. And I've linked to some of those in here, in the slides, some of the lessons that they developed, so you can actually go online and see those. Um, and I'm also on a project now for the 21st century literature and the Holocaust, um, looking at Holocaust literature that's been published since 2000 across the globe from different perspectives. Um, and that's through the University of Antwerp at Belgium. A few other publications um, that I've just listed here in case you wanna check them out. And hopefully um, my, <laughs> my newest book that I'm co-editing, Denial, The Final Stage of Genocide, will be out this spring from Rutledge. So we're excited about that. So a lot of my work is um, founded on the underlying ideologies of human rights education. And there are really three um, foundational ideas behind why we teach about human rights. The first is for global citizenship. 
Um, and so we want people to understand from a very young age that we're all members of an international community and that our actions and behaviors affect others that um, we need to learn to coexist. Um, so having intergroup contact and mutual understanding, which leads to social cohesion. cohesion. And then in the end, of course, um, transformative action. So a lot of times when we talk about teaching young people about war and genocide and conflict, um, you wanna make sure that you're also empowering them in some ways to do something about it. Now you know this information, what am I supposed to do with this information? So thinking of ways that we can inspire social change through, through action and um, activism. But all of these emphasize a commitment to counter injustice wherever in the world that it may take place. So when we talk about Holocaust and genocide education, there are some very particular um, you know, conventions and norms around, around this, but I like to start off asking, what is your why? So if you want to go onto your, if you have a smartphone, or if you want to go onto your, um, just another window on your laptop, and you can go to slido.com and put in the code 91358. And I'm trying this for the first time. I practiced it, but I'm not sure it went well. So let's see, slido.com. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a minute. And in just a second, your little um, poll should pop up. But thinking about why, why do you teach the Holocaust? <clears throat> the code is on there. It's 91358. Okay. And can you see the poll now? I'm looking, Sarah. Okay. Go to slido.com and enter the code 91358. It should ask you in a few words what's the main reason you will or you want to teach your students about the Holocaust. Okay, there we go. Great, so to prevent future generations to learn from the past so it doesn't happen again. History, so we don't forget. We need to do better in our relationships overall. Good. To give students a broader, more balanced global perspective. Excellent. Okay, honor the memories and understand how everyday people can be indoctrinated, yes. Absolutely. Okay, great. So along those lines, I'm going to do, and please don't feel like you have to put your name in this. This is not a graded quiz. This is a little quiz to see what do we actually know um, and what do we still need to know more about. So when we are teaching the Holocaust, it's important that we, of course, do our own research and have a, a strong foundation. So you should see a little quiz pop up on your screen. Do you see the quiz? <laughs> So what event sparked the beginning of World War II? <clears throat> you can vote if you want. It says voting closed. Oh, it does? Okay, I'll go to the next one then. So it, the right answer for this one is that Hitler invaded Poland on September 1st. They had a non-aggression pact. The assassination of Franz Ferdinand was what sparked World War I. See, that was a trick question. My apologies. <laughs> I won't do that again. <laughs> All right. So the next question, true or false, Hitler rose to power through democratic elections. True or false? Three seconds. 
Okay, the tricky one here is the answer is true. So although he declared himself, um, you know, the leader of Germany once the president died, he actually rose through political power through democratic elections in the Weimar Republic and got the party's backing. Okay, next question. True or false, the majority of the murders that occurred during the Holocaust occurred within Germany's national borders. True or false? Okay, false. I see some people answering in the chat, that's fine. The answer to this one is false. So the majority of the murders out actually occurred outside of Germany's national borders. So they sent people outside to go um, capture um, people to murder. Approximately how many people died during World War II? 75 million, 30 million, 11 million, or 6 million? I feel like I'm going to ask the question that a lot of people have on their mind. You, mm -hmm. you say people. People. All people. <laughs> so all of the people that died in World War II. <laughs> Good clarification question. <laughs> So it was 75 million in mm -hmm. World War II. The world over, 75 million people died. That's civilians, soldiers, and victims of the Holocaust. And then approximately how many people were displaced from the European continent in World War II? From the European continent. These are hard. <laughs> <laughs> looking at them like unless you really study the holocaust you probably wouldn't know <laughs> the answer to this one is 33 million so in the european continent alone 33 million people were displaced and then what laws were enacted in nazi germany in september 1935 that served to mark a social death for jewish citizens First major exclusionary laws that passed that excluded Jews from a lot of public places and everything else, <laughs> professions. All right. So the answer to this one is the Nuremberg laws. Great. So you all did well on these. There's one more question. And this gets into some comparative genocide stuff, but what genocide had a kill rate five times faster than the Holocaust? Bosnian, Armenian, Rwandan, or Cambodian? Good. All right, so it's the Rwandan genocide, right? So. In about three months in Rwanda, more than 800,000 people were killed. So that gives us the overview of who did well. I'm not going to put that up there for long because <laughs> that was just an intro, right? So those are some of the things that I hope that you do learn um, more about as we're going and as we have more questions. Um, are there specific things that you feel like you should know more about? Now, I've put this as a poll, but if you want to just add in the chat, or you can just think about it. And as we go, I'm happy to answer questions. And of course, Amanda has said there's gonna be a further Holocaust um, professional development opportunity soon. <clears throat> so I am going to go through um, just a very quick overview of sort of the Holocaust that, you know, things that show up quite regularly in children's and young adult literature. And I want to spend the majority of our time really digging into the literature that's available and how you might go about teaching it. Does anybody have any specific questions right before we move on? Okay, cool. I'm monitoring the chat. So if anybody has questions, um, I can either hold them until the end or I can ask Sarah while she's presenting um, okay. if it fits in. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So a lot of you mentioned your reasons why, and of course, 
there's now a state mandate that says that you have to, but it is important that we teach the Holocaust and genocide. A lot of times it is past oriented, like many of you mentioned. We want to honor the victims. We want to remember what happened. We want to educate our about our collective history as a global society. And then mainly um, they're future oriented. So we want to help prevent future atrocities. And part of that is working on relationships, like you said. And part of that is understanding that it took a lot of ordinary people um, to be very complicit in what was going on. We can't just say, oh, well, Hitler was just a really bad guy because Hitler could not accomplish what happened on his own, right? So we want to make sure that it gives us a chance to study ourselves. And this is from the museum, the Oregon Museum, um, that we study the Holocaust to study ourselves, to examine our responsibilities in an interconnected world where injustice persists on a grand scale. We study the Holocaust to study our connections to each other. So young people come to this study um, in an avenue where I think letting them learn how to identify injustice and what injustice looks like in practice and how injustice makes them feel and how injustice makes others feel and then what you can do in response to injustice when you see it happening in your life or the lives of others. So we'll talk more about that. A few considerations that I want to point out when you are teaching about the Holocaust, and some of you may have been doing this for a long time, and some of you may be new to it. Um, the first one is self-care and healthy coping mechanisms. And I say that at a time when we're all having to practice probably more self-care than we have in a while. Um, but teaching about war and genocide, especially to young people, is hard. Um, and it's an emotionally draining um, task. If you research it on a regular basis, it's, it can be um, taxing. And so I think having a really healthy way for you to manage um, these sorts of lessons and this sort of material is really important. Um, knowledge and preparing yourself. Um, of course, you're never going to have all the answers. And I think that it's really important when teaching the Holocaust and genocide to be willing to say, I don't know, but we can figure that out. Like, let's figure that out together or let's look into that some more. Um, but you're not expected to have all the answers. Um, and I would say for a lot of things, there aren't answer. You know, if, if a young person is like, but why are people so mean to each other? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know. So, you know, thinking through um, ways that you can help empower with knowledge, but also the limitations, and that's okay. Um, I like to think and emphasize a lot the power of language and labels. I think that that's really important, how careful we need to be with our language when we are talking about issues around war and genocide in particular. The existing resources um, that are out there, there are so many, and I've put links to a lot of them, but you also want to make sure you're practicing that information literacy that we want our students to practice, that not all resources are created the same. So just because someone created a resource about the Holocaust, that doesn't mean that it's accurate. Um, you want to make sure that you're checking to see where it comes from, who it's by, and that you're back backing up the information that's there to verify that it is in fact accurate information. And I've put links at the end of the slideshow for some that I highly recommend. Um, the Oregon Museum's website and their teaching resources are awesome. And I've also got links there to the USC Shoah Foundation, Yad Vashem, and the Holocaust Museum in DC. And then a few other smaller resources that I also use quite frequently too. Um, so when we're talking about using children's and young adult literature, particularly we, Elizabeth Bayer, the scholar in Children's Lit, says that what we're actually doing is creating a memory for young people. So they come without any real knowledge of the Holocaust, what it was, or, you know, um, if they've not been taught at home, of course. And so we are creating this memory. And so we want to make sure that we are using historically accurate information. Because if you open up gaps in knowledge or contested avenues, then you're also opening up spaces for denial. Um, and that's something that we're trying to combat um, on a daily basis. But you know, even with um, Holocaust denial, you have people who are being um, tried and put into prison across Europe right now for denying the Holocaust. And then you have other people who are being absolutely praised and put on a pedestal for Holocaust denial. So we wanna be careful and make sure that everything's historic historically accurate. 
And then of course you have to balance that with deep learning and pedagogy and engagement. Our young people have a ton of stuff vying for their attention right now. So if it's not engaging and it's not interesting, it, then they're, they're going to look away. Um, and so you've got to think about engagement and you don't want, um, you know, a book about the Holocaust for a young person to be delightful. <laughs> you don't want them to walk away feeling good about it, but you do want them to be interested and to have questions. And so we can think about how to create these frameworks of response when we introduce new text and new topics to them. And then, of course, you also have to think about the affective aspects um, because there's going to be there should be an emotional response like we're human beings and when you learn about conflict when you learn about genocide when you learn about the holocaust um it it needs to be a place and a learning environment where your students understand that it's okay to have emotions um when it comes to learning this kind of information um and then Okay, sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, cross or interdisciplinarity. So some different ways that um, some teachers I've worked with have um, taken Holocaust education or genocide education and implemented it in different classes, not just the ELA classroom as well. Okay, so a very, very condensed overview of the Holocaust and I'm I mean no disrespect by going so quickly through this but like I said I want to spend more of our time talking about the books um, so Ralph uh, Raphael Lemkin came up with the definition of genocide and it wasn't actually written down and legally agreed upon until 1944 so this is our when you know the near the end of the Holocaust but he spent his life working on this legal definition that the League of Nations, which would become the United Nations, could agree on. And we don't always understand the absolute importance of this, but if there is no crime defined, then there can be no justice or accountability. So if we don't even have a legal definition of the term, then what do you do with that? There's nothing you can do. I think one of the interesting things to point out about the definition of genocide as it currently stands is that it can mean any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a group. Now, technically you could commit genocide without ever actually killing anyone according to this definition. Because if you have the intention to destroy a group in whole or in part, and then therefore you go and impose measures intended to prevent births within the group. So the Tuskegee experiments that happened in North Carolina where doctors knowingly in, in, injected African American men with syphilis to make sure that it caused them to be able to not bear children. That, for instance, could technically fit under this definition. It's rare. It's never occurred that genocide has been um, used when people have not been killed. Um, but I think it's interesting to dig into this definition and really pick apart the wording of it so that you know this. The precondition. So I have put Wonder Woman up here and Peaky Blinders because they're excellent. <laughs> but also because they give us some pop cultural references to World War I and the after effects of World War I. Um, so we know that World War I was the deadliest war that we had ever experienced as human beings up until that point that's on record. Um, we know that we had new chemical weapons. We had airplanes involved in war, dropping bombs on people for the first time. We had progress getting us to a point of the destruction of human life that we had never seen before. And we know that a lot of people who did make it home from fighting in World War I experienced shell shock because PTSD wasn't a term yet. And so even though they may have survived physically, um, not all of them survived mentally or emotionally. And that occurs in Peaky Blinders. If you haven't seen it, you should totally watch it. It's so good. Anyway, and it's just starting in its new season to get up to the Nazis coming to power um, before World War II. All right, so historical anti-Semitism is obviously a precondition. There were already um, medical doctors and scientists who were supporting programs of eugenics 
Um, and we're kind of saying that it, as we progress, you know, really using social Darwinism, as we progress as a human species, where there are people we're going to have to get rid of. Um, they would call them useless eaters uh, a lot of times. Um, the racism that was inherent um, in, part, in our society at that time, increasingly negative attitudes towards the Slavs and towards Eastern Europeans, um, and then the cheapening of human life after World War I. Um, Doris Bergen has a great book that I've referenced later for you called A Concise Introduction to the Holocaust. And in it, she talks about her first two chapters that Hitler's main ideologies were race and space. He wanted an Aryan race and he needed space to build a larger, more powerful German empire. Um, so his goal was to get rid of people who weren't Aryan from a greater space across the European continent. And of course, all of that depended on political resentments, anti-Semitism, anti-modernism, social Darwinism, um, all of that sort of thing. So I think a lot of times when young people come to the Holocaust, they learn a lot about Hitler and you get this idea in your head that Hitler was this all powerful, like evil man. And that's just, it flattens out the realities of everything that had to come together over a historical time period to to lead to the preconditions of the Holocaust. I also um, encourage you not to use that term evil. Um, and this is simply because um, one of my colleagues, John Cox, and I talk a lot about this. It's that evil implies some sort of supernatural force, something beyond human control. And while personally, I do think a lot of the things that occurred were evil, when I'm talking to young people about it, I like to say, oh no, people made choices to do these things or to stand by while these things were happening. So we just wanna be a little careful with the use of that word as well. So with the effects of World War I, World War I um, broke out when there were multiple large empires in this part of the world. And after World War I, um, when the Axis powers were defeated and surrendered, it was broken up to the map more like on, on the right. So this is the post-World War I map where the Treaty of Versailles was signed and all of these larger empires were, were busted up into different countries. Poland is going to be particularly important because it is seen as like this new buffer zone. It's newly created buffer zone between Germany and the USSR. Stalin is in power in the USSR at this point. And eventually he and Hitler have a non-aggression pact over Poland that neither of them will invade that territory. It will remain a buffer zone between their two um, bad, <laughs> bad, bad human rights violating governments. And of course, Hitler does rise to power through democratic elections. Um, but upon the death of the president in August of 1934, Hitler goes ahead and assumes the power of the presidency and then eventually disintegrates the parliament. And so that's how he becomes the full dictator, the totalitarian dictator. And upon his ascendancy, of course, he introduces the early stages of persecution. So underlying discrimination, social injustice, you know, unchecked racism, all of that was going on and permeating the society. But in 1935, with the passing of the Nuremberg Laws, Jews actually became legally excluded from aspects of public and social life across Germany. Um, and those were the, with the Nuremberg Laws. And so you can actually go and read through what the Nuremberg Laws were, but it excluded a lot of Jews from holding political office, from practicing law, from practicing medicine. It targeted a lot of Jewish intellectuals. So during genocide, they often target um, the muscle and the minds first. So they will get rid of the super intelligent people, and then they will also get rid of the people of fighting age first, because once you get them out of the way, everybody else becomes an easier target, is the thinking there. It also was already introduced the first concentration camps. So these existed in the 1920s, the late 1920s. And it's important to remember that Hitler um, and his posse didn't create the notion of concentration camps. They mimicked it because they had seen it before. So concentration camps were also used along with things like death marches um, in the Armenian genocide, which had taken place during the time of World War I. 
So illustrations from a children's book. So the Germans also knew to target children and start to influence their thinking and their ideologies and their ways of thinking about Jews in particular very early in their lives. And this is an image from a German um, Nazi children's book that was popular at the time. And these are sort of the, the main posse, Hitler's peeps. Um, if you will. And so you want to kind of know who they are, at least these four, and I'll put three more on the next slide. Um, Joseph Goebbels, that little dweeb at the bottom, <laughs> you know, he was in charge of propaganda. And even though he looks ridiculous, um, he was very good at it. And so he's always a really interesting character to study the use of propaganda and misinformation and the way that they manipulated language to turn people's thinking, um, very comparative to sort of contemporary media, if you wanted to do something like that. Hermann Goering, Heinrich Himmler, and Rudolf Hess. And then of course, Karl Brandt, who was in charge of the euthanasia program where they would systematically murder people who were disabled. Um, Adolf Eichmann, who's very interesting and we'll come back to him because he did flee to Argentina. Um, and avoided capture until the 1970s. He was extradited by the Jewish, um, I call him the Jewish mafia. <laughs> they went to, basically went to Argentina and got him and had him sent back for trial and he was executed. Um, and then the SS physician, Joseph Mengali, who was also known as the angel of death, who did a lot of really terrible medical experiments on um, prisoners in Auschwitz, including most notably is known for the, the twin experiments. Um, but they did target young people. So like we're trying to, you know, talk to young people about being open-minded and avoiding these types of behaviors. The Nazis targeted young people by encouraging certain types of behaviors. So they took over the national curriculum. So by the age of six years old, when German children were enrolled in schools, they were already learning historical revisionism that made Germany the main victim of World War I um, and made everyone else terrible people, pretty much, politically. And then also about racial hygiene. So they would use these charts where they would measure people's skulls and show the size of their noses. And you know, the, the more Aryan someone looked physically, then the more hygienic they were. Um, and so you can, you can read up about the Nazi national curriculum. They had also started the Hitler Youth, and there is a book called A Child of Hitler, Life in Germany When God Wore a Swastika. I think that's the full name of it. But um, anyway, it's Alphon Hess. He's, it's a memoir of him as a child. And he said, you know, I didn't join the Hitler Youth early on, but very quickly you realized if you didn't join the Hitler Youth, you also couldn't participate in social life. So you couldn't play on the sports teams. You couldn't go to the summer camps. Other boys wouldn't want to be your friend because you weren't part of the Hitler Youth. So early on, it wasn't required, um, but you were definitely socially ostracized if you didn't join. Um, and then by the 1933, the Hitler Youth became a requirement for 10 year olds and up. And so you do know that this indicates the Nazis had a very clear idea of the long game. They were already training these 10 year old boys to become SS, and a lot of them did. And then I've put a link to one of the most popular children's books called The Poisonous Mushroom. You can actually link to this and go read it. It's terrible, um, and especially in terms of its um, portrayals of Jewish people. But the basic idea is that Jews are the poisonous mushroom in our society, and we all need to be constantly on the lookout for them so we can burrow them out and get rid of them. A couple of other major events that often show up in children's and young adult literature. The first, of course, is Kristallnacht, um, which was a national organized pogrom. Hopefully, <laughs> we're not going to see something similar this week on Inauguration Day. Um, so it was well organized. This middle map shows black dots where there were attacks on Jewish synagogues. There were more than 100 synagogues burned across Germany on this one weekend. Um, and there were attacks on Jews and their businesses. So it's called the night of broken glass when shop windows were destroyed, homes were attacked um, and Jews were attacked and killed. After Kristallnacht in 1938, 
25% of the remaining Jewish population in within Germany's borders and annexed Austria this time fled. So a lot of people up until this point had just thought it's just, you know, some walls, they're trying to exclude us, they're trying to push us out, but we're not going to go, we're not going to run away, this is our home. And after Kristallnacht, 25% were like, okay, so this just got way worse than we had anticipated, and so they fled. This is also the time that Hitler decided to make it a lot harder to flee, which is another indication that he had no, he didn't want Jews to just not be in Germany and Austria, he wanted them to not exist. Um, so it became a lot more expensive, um, it became a lot more dangerous for Jews to try to flee from the Nazis after Kristallnacht as well. From 38 to 1940, so a lot of times young people will ask, well, didn't the United States know what was going on? Like, why didn't people help? Great question. We could talk all day about that. But one of the things that did happen is that the United Kingdom agreed to, um, to take about 10,000 refugee Jewish children. And this was known as the kinder transport. Um, and so you can find out more information about this. Um, you can read a lot of their stories and diaries of the kids who were sent to Great Britain from Nazi Germany. Um, and then if you ever get to the UK up in the Lake District, there's actually a museum up there in Ambleside just about the kinder transport because a lot of these kids ended up going all the way to the north of England to hide. Um, and, and there's a story about that at the museum there, which is really cool. Okay, so this is just um, a lot of the other topics that show up um, in the literature. So, you know, the, I, the key events of the war, the euthanasia program, the eugenics programs where they really tried to prevent, um, you know, they had such euphemisms for it, but, you know, <laughs> offspring that were unclean, um, and they prohibited marriages between people with Jewish people. The persecution and the murder of Jews, the creation of the ghettos and the different types of ghettos. So there were open ghettos and closed ghettos and the conditions in each of those were, were a bit different. And then, of course, there were some ghettos where the International Red Cross would get wind the bad things were happening. So they would come in and they would like dress up the ghettos and make them look like they were great fun and all the Jews wanted to live there. They particularly did this at Terrorism um, and there's information in films about that. Um, forced displacement. Um, if you've read Refugee by Alan Gratz, which is one of the books that I'll recommend, um, he talks about a boy and his family fleeing from the Holocaust aboard the SS St. Louis. So this was a ship with 963 Jews from the European continent that fled and they were to go to Cuba and they had their visas, um, but Cuba would not let them in. And then they went to the coast of Miami and Florida and the United States would not let them in. Um, and so they ended up being sent back to Europe and um, more than two thirds of them actually died during the Holocaust. FDR did organize the Evian Conference to talk about what the rest of the world was going to do in response to the refugee crisis. Um, in 1938, so they were they met in France, and one country agreed to increase the acceptance of Jewish refugees. Does anybody know which country it was? I can't see if you're guessing, so I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> it was the Dominican Republic. So internationally, they were the only, uh, only country that agreed to increase their intake uh, quota of Jewish refugees at the time. This just shows you can look at newspaper covers and see that people did know what was going on. So the New York Times reported about Crystal Knott. Um, and up here you have Jewish people are banned or barred from business by the German government. So what was going on was being reported internationally. So if people tried to claim like, well, we didn't know. Yes, you did. You just chose not to do anything about it. So I think that's an important lesson too. Um, the mobile killing squads, which would go out into the forest and look for Jews in hiding. If you watch like Inglorious Bastards, um, you know, that's sort of them on the hunt. Um, the expansion of the concentration camp system, the Wannasee conference where they actually came up with the final solution and decided to create and begin using the six killing centers. 
Um, the additional victims of Nazi persecution. So understanding and getting young people to understand that Jehovah's Witnesses, Roma and Gypsy people, Catholics, um, you know, that the Jews weren't the only victims, that they actually targeted all kinds of different groups. Um, resistance is another important topic. So you can talk about Jewish resistance and non-Jewish resistance. Um, you can talk about rescue, the death marches, liberation, and then, of course, displacement, immigration, and the creation of the state of Israel. So, Sarah, I just want to just pause there for a second and say two things. One, that was a whole bunch of topics on that last page. And <laughs> I want to go into a little bit more detail. Um, the USHMM has an amazing encyclopedia for you that will include all of this information. So you can pretty much type up anything about the Holocaust and get um, a really nice, relatively brief overview of every single one of these topics. And I'm also just looking at time and I want to make sure that we spend a good amount on the book. So maybe I'm going to recommend that we pivot that way. Um, sure. And then again, you're all going to get the PowerPoint presentation afterwards. So if there's any specific topics that you want more information about, you can email myself or Sarah, or again, go on to USHMM and I use their encyclopedia all oh. the time because believe it or not, I still don't know everything about the Holocaust. And it's great. Um, it's a, so I just would point out, I do have some, some things about notable resistance, some of the events of World War II that are, that are important to point out, and then also the post-liberation stuff that happens. But there's so much information about this stuff online. And again, if you do have questions about it further, I'm happy to answer them. Um, I'm having a real problem at the moment because a lot of the Proud Boys are wearing these t-shirts that say 6MWE, and if you aren't aware, that stands for 6 million wasn't enough, um, and that's one of their slogans at the moment. Um, so anyway, here's a list of some books that I have used in my research that I think are really worth having a look at as well. Doris Bergen's is excellent for an intro, and it's an easy read. Um, as well. And John Cox is a friend of mine, but his book is also a very easy read that talks about more contemporary genocides if you want to get into to that sort of thing. Okay, now let's get to the good part. The children's and young adult books. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the criteria um, that I suggest, like from the research that people have done in children's literature, some of the criteria that we would use to pick and choose books, some things you need to be conscious of, some books that I would recommend with some lesson plans ideas, and then some reservations um, about some books that I do have. So we're not gonna go and do a poll since we are short on time, but what are some of the criteria that you think we should have in mind when we're reading books for potential inclusion in the, in the curriculum about the Holocaust. If you wanna put that in the chat, what criteria do you think? Historical accuracy, bingo. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> that should be number one. And of course that requires us to know or to check on the information, right? What else? Engaging, good. So it needs to be something that's gonna keep readers' attention. Accessible, good. Compassionate, right? So encouraging a compassionate stance. It builds a human connection, good. Younger students should be able to relate, awesome. Context, good, yeah. And sometimes to compare it to modern situations, great. Excellent, okay. So we're all on the same page pretty much then. So I will just give you from the literature, and if you check in the slides on the notes section, I've put links to these different articles where this stuff comes from. Historical accuracy should always be our number one concern because we're creating that memory. Weighing up the potential beneficence with the potential to traumatize young readers. Right, so we want to make sure we know why we're teaching a certain text and it's okay to shock young people. Um, sometimes they need to be shocked to really understand the magnitude of something, right? And there's a difference in finding something shocking and traumatizing. So you want to, you know your students, right? And I don't. So that's something that you have to pick up on. There are distancing techniques that authors often use. So for instance, you're rarely going to see a book um, where the main character is killed. There might be 
secondary characters that die, but rarely would that focalizing main character be killed in a, in a, in a book for young people. Um, you will often see things where they hint at something, like they hear gunshots in the distance, but you don't actually get the description of a gunshot entering somebody's body or anything like that, right? So there are these distancing techniques for young people that are often employed. The quality of the writing and the illustration is still important. And like you mentioned, the paratext or what context do they give a young reader? So I think in Eve Bunting's book, Terrible Things, which I'm going to point out a little bit more in a minute, she gives a very good intro letter to the reader. Like sometimes terrible things happen. And when we don't do anything to stop them, they can continue happening, right? So, and she talks specifically about the Holocaust. Um, and how are readers positioned to respond? Again, now that you know this, what are you supposed to do with it? And we need to be prepared to have those conversations. Um, which aspects of the Holocaust are included and therefore open for further discussion and lessons? Whether the book reinforces or challenges negative stereotypes? And the golden rule of children's and young adult literature is having a hopeful ending. And that does not mean a happy ending, okay? but it does mean a hopeful ending. So if it's regeneration or something like this is what happened later in the epilogue, like this is how we heal from this sort of thing. Some limitations of Holocaust education are not enough attention to the power of language and those labels that are used. Condensing the narrative to one or two stories. So when I've done research on what people are using to teach the Holocaust, especially in middle school and high school, it always comes back to like, I read The Diary of a Young Girl and Night. Great books, excellent. But if those are the only two books that you ever get and that's all you learn about the Holocaust, that's a very flat narrative of what happened to the majority of people, okay? So it's not saying don't use those, it's just saying there needs to be more. Sarah, sorry, I'm just interrupting here for a second because I just wanna let everybody know that starting next year, we're working with our Speakers Bureau to write six or sorry five to seven page summaries of each one of their experiences so that the, those are going to be available to teachers to use with their students so we're working with our speakers to make them accessible to kids and so you don't have to read an entire book with them so i just i i have that same problem i think about it all the time these are the two books how can we add in more stories and make them local histories so keep your eye out for that next year Awesome. That's great. Right. Another one is creating hierarchies of suffering. So trying to compare that, you know, one genocide was worse than the other. Or one person had it worse. Like, no, like every, it sucks for everybody. Right. So let's don't do that. Let's not do the comparing and creating hierarchies and not including death. So to teach young people about the Holocaust and not include death, that's, that's irresponsible because it's inaccurate and it's untrue and attempting to offer simple explanations to complex questions. So again, it's okay to say, I don't know. A lot of times I tell my college students, they come like with, why didn't the US agree to take more refugees? And I'm like, well, let's go and look at what happened in Congress. What were the debates? Why did this happen? But not just saying because they were racist. Like it was a lot more complicated than that. So some of the foundations, I've tried to break it down into um, these categories of identity, action and concepts that we can teach young people about and a lot of these I saw um a lot of these I saw in like your responses to things that you were trying to teach and things at different grade levels and I think that's excellent so you know in kindergarten we might not introduce the holocaust itself but we can definitely talk about stereotypes and discrimination uh, right um so we can definitely talk about injustice um, and allyship and what it means to be a good friend and what it means to be a good citizen. Um, so that's sort of what I've put here for my young readers. Um, more and more of these books have started coming out in the past five years even that I am in love with. Uh, a is for activist. There is peaceful fights for equal rights, which is one of my favorite to give to my teacher friends um, that just show different ways that kids can be involved and take action. You also have stories about empathy. I'm a human. Um, what does it mean to be kind? Um, and then you have stories just about cultural diversity. So the, we have an overwhelming problem with white protagonists and white children's literature 
in this country. And unless we make a concerted effort to find books with characters of color that represent different nationalities, different ethnicities, different religious groups, then it's hard to just have them in there. We need to make a conscious effort to include them. Because one of the goals, again, of global citizenship is learning about people who are different from us from a very early age. And at this point, we still have at least 63% of the children's books published every year have white main characters. And animal characters can also be racialized. Let's just make a point of that. Now, I never, growing up in North Carolina, read many books about Jewish culture. So if we really want a, found, you know, a foundation for the study of the Holocaust, then we can start to introduce fun books but that feature Jewish people and Jewish culture, okay? So try to choose books, a lot of diversity, books that are written by in-group members and paying attention to authenticity and stereotypes. Possible learning activities I've put here you know, get students to tell a story about their culture, their families, and it depends on the students in your classroom, right? Like you might not, I have a lot of dreamer students, so I'm not going to ask like, where are you from? Because some of them may not feel safe saying that, you know, right? So you have to do this for your class. Tell a story about a time when you were made to feel bad and what helped you feel better. Draw a picture of yourself and all the things you love about yourself. Organize a citizen of the week election in class and talk about what it means to be a good citizen. There's another book by Dave Eggers called What Does a Citizen Do? And it talks about citizenships, rights, and responsibilities. Make protest signs. So I have loved nothing more than going to protest and just seeing little babies like infants holding up little signs with scribbles on them. And I'm like, yes, I need that kid. <laughs> Um, and then I have put a link to a lesson plan that one of my teachers I worked with in Charlotte did with set for a second grade classroom on identifying what it means to have a right to a quality education. And then they actually write letters to the school board as one of their learning activities about, you know, these are the aspects of my education that aren't quality. And this is what I, I want to point out to you. So it's, it's a pretty cool lesson plan. To introduce the Holocaust, I often encourage people to use terrible things an allegory of the Holocaust. Like I said, it does include the paratext. There's a really good author's note about in the Holocaust, six million Jews were killed and many other people were killed. Um, and when we don't do anything to help, and if we start to forget, then it could happen again. But it does include a lot of distancing. So there's animal characters, it's black and white to really portray the seriousness of the subject matter, but the shadowy figures are the perpetrators. So there's not an actual like physical embodiment of like a human coming after them or it's just a, a shadow, right? So um, the focalizing character who is little rabbit does survive. And upon surviving says, you know, I need to go and warn the other people um, is important. Um, yeah. Then, of course, it, you, you can talk about bystanding. So this is based on the, um, the poem, you know, they came for the socialists and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a socialist. So it sort of follows that path, but they come to the forest for the different animal groups. Um, so bystanding, having a voice, the responsibility to protect, arbitrary definitions of the targeted group. They come for all things that have feathers and fly in the sky. And the rabbits don't say anything because they don't fly in the sky. But then all their bird friends get taken. So it's stuff like that. And then allyship and activism. So grades two through four, I really, um, these that I have put in blue actually address issues of the Holocaust and the Cold War and World War II. Yertle the Turtle um, by Dr. Seuss was Hitler in the initial drawings. He had a Hitler mustache and the publishers made him remove it, but it's still clear in the context of Holocaust education. I love using Horton Here's a Who to teach about the responsibility to protect. So just because those people are small and you may not be able to hear them or see them, you still can do something to help them. Um, and then of course, I like to talk to second through fourth graders a lot about activism or resistance. Um, so the youngest marcher is about Audrey Faye Hendricks, who at the age of 10 marched with Martin Luther King and was put into jail for five days. Um, and so there's, all kinds of different lessons that you can use in this age group that tie into the Holocaust or that are specific to the Holocaust, I would recommend these three in particular. And again, you know your students. I, I 
do not classify books into a certain age or grade because different students in any grade can be very different. Um, but I think these are some good ones. Benno and the Night of Broken Glass. Again, it's an animal character. So there's some distancing, but it's a very lovable animal character. So there's that uh, affective dimension. Like we care about this kitty cat. We want the kitty cat to be okay. The kitty cat is obviously scared. Um, but it's a link to Crystal Knot. Um, the Whispering Town is a story of community and helpers and the acts of resistance. So this whole town waits to a night when there is no moon and they take turns whispering to help the Jews get down to a boat so that they can escape and go over to like Finland or something, some, one of those Sc Scandinavian countries. <laughs> so um, I, I do encourage you not to focus solely on rescue narratives because again, that creates a false sense that most people were rescued. Um, but I think it's important to note stories of rescue and resistance, but you can't make that the one story just because it, it's the more comfortable story. Yeah, and Sarah, I wanna add in there as well that if you're gonna teach rescue and resistance, put into context, what are the obstacles to rescue and resistance? Things in context that make it difficult because otherwise I think it's very easy for kids to feel bad or, or it makes it seem like it's so easy to do. Why didn't more people do it? Right. So look at the context of why, what, what made it difficult or what made it possible. So the whispering town, when we're looking at the mass rescue of Danish Jews, well, they're surrounded by water and across the way from Sweden, a neutral country that wasn't plausible for Hungarian Jews. Right. Yeah, that's important. And I also think if you are, we had a conversation about this in Charlotte because we have a high population of um, students of color. And if you do have a classroom with a lot of students in color, of color, it, it's important to acknowledge that white people are privileged when it comes to acts of resistance. <laughs> I mean, we just saw that. Um, you know, if, if a lot of people of color had stormed a federal building, there would have been a lot more bloodshed. So, you know, that when our students of color are encouraged to resist that there are different consequences um and and we need to acknowledge that and help you know help our white students acknowledge that as well um okay and then hidden this is a great story i really like it's more of like a graphic novel so not a full graphic novel but easing into graphic novel territory um, intergenerational storytelling and i think this is important because grandparents will often tell stories of survival to their grandchildren, but they don't tell their parents. And so you hear, if, you, if you've read like Mouse, you know, where he has a very strained relationship with his father because he never feels like he knows his father because he never got the story of his father's survival and his fight. And so I think that tension um, within the family and within generations is really interesting. And that's something that you could talk about. Um, we know from the get-go that this little girl's grandmother survived. So there's a frame story and that's comforting. So she's going to tell us about her experiences during the Holocaust, but we know that she survived because she's there at the beginning of the story. And so, you know, students can, can deal with that. It does talk a lot about that social death. So her being asked to leave her school, her best friend was not Jewish. So they basically had to break up. Um, uh, and then acts of resistance and helpers are in there. So the people who helped hide her, her family had to leave her for a little while. So real things that happened, but in a very kind of comforting way, but a historically accurate way. Lesson ideas. Um, at this, in this age group, it's like two, second to fourth grade. I love the idea of introducing the kids version of the Declaration of Human Rights. Um, which came about in response to the Holocaust. So after the Holocaust, Eleanor Roosevelt um, led the charge to actually write down um, the, the Declaration of Human Rights that lists 30 rights that we as humans have um, that are violated on a daily basis. But, you know, to learn that those are what rights are. And then I usually use caring for others here to talk about Horton Hears a Who and our responsibility to protect. Um, what does it mean to be a good friend or to be a helper? How to nonviolently but firmly confront discrimination, I think is a very important lesson. And I think adults don't often know how to do that. <laughs> so
So maybe that's something to talk to, you know, with your therapist or your partner and be like, what should we do here? Um, but how do you do that when you see it in real life? Empathy mapping is something I love. I actually stole this from business school, a business school, because they were talking about empathy mapping for potential um, customers to buy things. And I was like, but what if you did an empathy map with a character? Like, what is this character seeing? What are they saying? How are they feeling? Um, and I did that with one of my classes last semester and it, it worked really well. Um, they can interview a grandparent, you know, like let's learn about our own family histories um, and, and share those. So the art of storytelling. And here's another lesson that I've um, called It's Your Right. And it was for a fourth grade classroom to learn to identify what their rights are. And then to kind of come up with strategies that they might use when they do confront bullying or discrimination or they see that their rights or the rights of their friends are not being met. Um, so again, now that you know what your rights are, what do you do if they're not being met? That kind of action part. Grades four through six, um, where I, I think most people really do start to get into talking about the actual Holocaust um, and actual genocide. Um, the definitions, of course, are always important. Um, the context is always important. I read Number of the Stars at the end of fourth grade. Um, and I was very interested in that book. Uh, of course, it is a Gentile um, is the main character. So, and it's her Jewish friend and she's a helper. It does talk a lot about the early discrimination. It is a story of rescue. Um, but then of course you've got the issues of displacement. Um, one of my favorites to use is um, Once and Then. It's the first two books. In the Morris Gleetzman, um, there's four books total, but these first two, um, once we're introduced to Felix, who is a Jewish boy who is hiding in a Catholic orphanage. So his parents hid him in this Catholic orphanage and he sees the Nazis come and burn the books and his parents were book owners, like they owned a bookshop. So he gets worried. So he runs away to go try to find them. And it has all kinds of different topics that you can explore. Um, hiding in plain sight, fragmented identity from having to change your name, your appearance. He eventually does become very good friends with a little girl whose parents were Nazis, but they were killed by the Polish resistance. And so this notion that he and a Nazi child could become family because they haven't been taught to hate each other um, yet. Uh, I don't, I don't know. My students respond really well to these, these books. And I think that they're done in a way that's engaging. Like the end of chapters have like these cliffhangers. There's a little bit of humor, like comic relief stuff, like not disrespectfully, but enough to kind of um, give you a little bit of space to process some of the other stuff that's going on. So Morris Gleitzman writes a lot of hard topics for young people in ways that are super, um, he does it really well, I think. Rose Blanche is a picture book. Not sure if you're um, aware of this one, but it's very beautiful. Roberto Innocenti is an actual artist from Italy who did the illustrations. They're very detailed and you're always looking for this little girl and she wears a red bow. So it's almost like a Where's Waldo kind of thing looking for her in the busyness of the illustration. So it stops you and you engage with the images. She finds a concentration camp just outside of her village and she starts taking food and sneaking it into them. Um, and halfway through the book, there's a shift from her first person perspective. Like I see these people, I get them some food, I take it to them to Rose Blanche was walking through the forest. So it switches. And of course, Rose Blanche is in reference to the white rose movement, which was one of the major resistance movements of Germans. So they were non-Jewish Germans. Um, and then there were, Jewish resistance and non-Jewish resistance, but one of the major movements. And then at the end of this book, Rose Blanche is shot and killed um, by the Russian army as they advance towards liberation. It is not portrayed. It says there was a shot, you turn the page and she's no longer there. And then at the end, where she was shot, there's like a new garden growing and the war torn landscape has started to grow back and there's like a poppy seed growing where she had stood. So again, it's not happy ending, 
but it is more of a hopeful regeneration. This is what happens after liberation sort of book. So lesson plans for four through sixth grade. And have you guys seen Jojo Rabbit? Yes. I love it. I love that movie. Um, so friends from different backgrounds activities. So what do you still have in common? So, you know, even though we're different, like what do we actually still like? So I'm not a fan of, oh, we're all the same. No, we're not. We're all different, but that doesn't mean we can't like each other. So I think, you know, finding things that are interesting um, about each other. I married a foreigner and that's good because we've been married 16 years on Friday and we still learn from each other. And they get a lot more holidays in Australia. So I'm like, it's the queen's birthday. I can't come in today. <laughs> so helping those in need, um, researching local organizations. I love service learning projects. So, you know, if it's uh, refugee councils or even working with the, um, you know, anything that they're interested in that's relevant. Holocaust survivor talks at this point, I think are really interesting. Um, I think kids start to ask good questions and they start to think more um, abstractly and be able to better empathize. And they also start to really think about morality and that, you know, rightness and wrongness and how the shades of gray around that. And then I think um, talking about resistance um, is also important here. Um, I have this activity, again, depending on your class makeup, but unpacking the knapsack of white privilege. I'm not sure if any of you have done this before. Um, it's from Macintosh, but I've put a link there and it has the whole activity sheet. Just learning about privilege and what it is and racism and digging into how it penetrates our daily lives. And then um, white privilege and being normal is a lesson plans for fifth grade and understanding privilege and black invisibility. So again, lessons that you could take and kind of shape around issues of racism, discrimination, bullying within the Holocaust or in society in general as preconditions for things that lead to genocide. So okay. It's, yes. it's 11.15. Okay. If we, and I know Sarah is gonna stick around from 11.30 to 12, so if people do have other questions and you have time and you wanna stay and ask, um, but I also just wanna make sure that we have some time for people to ask you questions. Absolutely, I can stop talking. <laughs> My mouth's dry. I will just point out these, so grade six through eight, these are some of the books, most of the time the book thief is left toward high school. Another one for high school I really like is Postcards from No Man's Land by Aiden Chambers. Um, Refugee is great. Milkweed is more about life in the ghettos. I love Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, and it would be an, you know, a tangent to introduce the Holocaust, but it's very clear that the children are Jewish children um, in the first book, at least. Um, yeah, and they're, the children in the Holocaust and World War II, their secret diaries, those are diverse experiences and they're very short vignettes. So you can pick and choose a few of them rather than having them read the whole book. Mm. I find those really valuable when you don't have a lot of time and you want to perhaps separate into um, different reading groups into a jigsaw. Right. Things like that. Yeah. And then, of course, I've just put some lesson plans ideas. I do want to point out a few books I have reservations about, and then I'll stop so you can ask questions. Um, the first is The Yellow Star, The Legend of King Christian X of Denmark. It's a, it's a good book. Um, it's not a true story. And so this is where there were Jews who went to Denmark and they were in hiding. And so the whole town decided to wear stars so that the Nazis couldn't identify them. It's a great idea. Um, I wish somebody had done it but they didn't. <laughs> um, so again, it's okay, but you need to know that it's not a true story. The Boy in the Strap Pajamas I have a lot of problems with, and I know it is one of the most often used texts um, in a lot of middle schools, um, but it is very historically inaccurate. Uh, there's no way that the son of the Auschwitz Commandant wouldn't have known what was going on and wouldn't have known that Schmel was a Jew um, it's very unlikely that a child Schmel's age would have been in Auschwitz because he would have already been killed by then, um, most likely. Um, and then at the end, when he, he does make an ironic joke in the very last page about, you know, it's not like these things are still happening today. And I don't think the intended audience understands that sort of 
irony yet. Um, so I have a lot of problem with the way it infantilizes the main character and some of the historical inaccuracies in that book. Mm -hmm. Not saying, you know, you can use it, but if you do, just be aware of those things and address them. Briar Rose is also a good book and I love Jane Yolen, but no one survived the gas chambers. And this is almost a retelling of Kilno through a retelling of Sleeping Beauty. And Briar Rose is in the gas chambers, gets brought out, and then she wakes up. And that's really problematic for me. Um, and then this, Let the Celebrations Begin, is just way too pretty and smiley of the Jews in the concentration camps. So, all right. So I'm going to stop. There's some books for high school I've included for you. And again, if you have questions about those, I'm happy to answer them. But does anybody want to ask any questions? I you can, <laughs> or if you want to raise your hand in the participants tab. Um, and sir, I just want to say one of the things that I, I really appreciate from what you um, said, and I, it goes back to the beginning, and I think a lot of the teachers here hopefully have been sitting with that, is the difference between shock and trauma and hopeful and happy. And so when I was looking at a lot of the teachers, because of course I have... I've been watching everybody's video and being like looking at how they're reacting. And when I, when I saw you mention shock versus trauma, I saw their faces like, yeah, that's something that I constantly grapple with. And especially when we're talking K through five, uh, we want to protect their innocence, but we also want to share the reality of the world with them. And how do we balance that? So thank you for kind of sitting with that and it's an enduring question I'm going to leave with. Mm -hmm. um, but again, if any of y'all have other questions, put them in the chat, raise your hand in the participants tab. Um, what questions do you have for Sarah? So the bibliography, again, I'm going to share the PowerPoint with you and all of the books are in that PowerPoint. I tried, and on, there's another list on the next slide where it's like a bunch of other books that I recommend, um, especially that have to do with other genocides. If, if you want to go there, Forgotten Fire by Adam Bagdasarian about the Armenian genocide is one of my, I love it. And my students always love it. It is probably better for high school because there are instances of sexual assault in it, which I think is important. Um, to include, but again, that's one of those things where you've got to have a student body who's ready to talk about those things. Um, and then I see people trying to open up the link. I just changed the link, so hopefully it'll work. Um, I put in there, it's a draft of the grade level appropriate um, themes and questions that I'm working on with our teacher advisory board for K through five. If you teach six through 12, there are already essential questions on our website, but these are specifically for elementary school. And so we looked at state standards, we looked at SB 664 content concepts, and it's not done yet, but these are specific questions that we're trying to, you know, encourage you to ask with your students that are in-depth questions, but again, grade level appropriate. And so Sarah, when you were talking about, I'm thinking about fourth grade as state history, and that's where we, in the questions start to talk about the destruction of communities. Yep. And instead, especially with indigenous communities. Right. And I know that you included some books at the end on the last slides about um, indigenous genocide. So I really appreciate that and I encourage you all to look at that as well. Um, and Joseph Bruchak is a great writer right now for young adults that he does a lot of native, he's a native American man and does a lot of Native American stories. I think Two Roads, my nephew read that last year in sixth grade. Um, but again, he's an insider and of course Sherman Alexi. I do love Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian to talk about the ongoing effects of Native American destruction, like cultural destruction and disenfranchisement. Um, we did get a question about picture books. So Molly, um, using picture books with middle and high school students, absolutely. I think it's a nice way to sort of ease into topics, but to actually, they are more comfortable talking about issues like discrimination, bullying, like even Yertle the Turtle, um, uh, than to just jump into, so 
something that they don't feel that they know about. And a lot of times young people don't want to be disrespectful, but they don't know how to word things. So they just don't ask. But if you introduce it in a way that is more abstract and then bring it back to that, I think that can be really useful. Um, there's a book called The Rabbits, which is by Sean Tan and John Marsden, so from Australia, but it is only a high school curriculum in Australia, even though it's a picture book, but it is about the uh, Aboriginal um, population and how they were desecrated upon the arrival of the British. So the rabbits are the British. Um, and it's beautiful and lots of digital literacy. If you're looking for computer games, so I actually have, there's games for change. There's one like Syrian Journey. I put a link to that. It's created by the BBC where you actually go in and try to figure out what path you would take to try to flee from Syria. And it tells you what happens. Um, and again, that's probably more high school, but I get them to do a reflection on how did it make you feel to, to be in that situation. And a lot of times they're like powerless because it was like, you're damned if you go that way and you're damned if you go that way and you don't know. And I'm like, that's what it feels like. Um, so yeah, there's, you know, other resources that are really, really good as well. Other questions? Yeah, I'm looking. Um, Paul? who works up at Seattle at the Holocaust Center for Humanities there. Uh, do you have any recommendations, lessons that can or should be used for establishing context at different grade bands? Um, I think the links that I've put with, um, to the US Holocaust Memorial website, um, teaching resources, they have a lot of good things for different um, grade levels there. Um, I would use, I like to start off with things about like the empathy mapping and recognizing bullying and understanding what human rights are and then getting into recognizing when human rights are being violated and what to do about the, you know, so I have some lessons around that. Um, but I don't have anything particular. I use the uh, unpacking the knapsack of white privilege. I have had my cousin use that in the past in her fifth grade class. And that's been really useful in terms of talking about racism and then sort of leading into um, racism throughout history and the different ways it's shown up. And then she'll go into stuff about the Holocaust once she's talked about racism within our own community. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have anything specific, but I know probably the museum does um, and the Holocaust Museum does break it down for you like that. Yeah. I know we're going to be working with, again, our teacher advisory board. There aren't an abundance of lesson plans for elementary school. So that's why our first goal was to come up with core questions that you can ask based off of different books and things. Um, and then we'll be working to create local connection lesson plans to provide um, support in that area. Right. And I think if you look at the books, like the books that I put, tried to put in the different grade levels, once you get a hand on the book and kind of look through that, it'll point you to the more contextual stuff you need. So it might point you to a rescuer story. It might point you to stories about the preconditions. Um, it might point to you about resistance. Um, and so that would help, I think, too. Yeah. So I just put in the link for the post survey for everybody. And again, remember if you are asking for professional development units, you must fill out that link. I will be sending Sarah's slides in a follow-up email, um, probably tomorrow because this is also a paid holiday for me too. So I'm gonna go take the afternoon off. Um, <laughs> um, but again, if you have any questions, Sarah, I wanna thank you so much. I'm sad that this pandemic is still going on but I'm happy that it provided us the opportunity to bring you to us virtually. Right. Um, it's gonna stay around for up to another half an hour. So if you wanted to ask more specific questions in an intimate atmosphere, she will be available for you. Um, yeah. Always, if you have any questions, feel free to email either of us. And um, I look forward to seeing you at another one of our professional developments. Yes, thank you all so much. I love getting to work with teachers. So please reach out to me if you do have further questions and if you need help on how to implement the resources or do the books. I'm around sheltering at home forever. It seems like. <laughs>